Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Do you feel it? Do you feel that chill in the air? Do you, did you feel the temperature in the room change by like 40 degrees? No, no, I'm not talking about actual temperature in the actual room because where I'm broadcasting from, it's like 140 degrees currently in here because while I'm broadcasting from, you know, West Texas, Abilene, Texas to be exact, and it's, you know, a hundred and something degrees outside. It is hot. It's clearly summertime here in West Texas, but on this podcast, in fact, for this very podcast series called Set Apart, a look at the doctrine of sanctification, did you feel the temperature change? Because it got really cold and it got so cold that everyone decided they were going to go inside. They were going to, they were like, that's it. I'm done. It's too cold because I questioned a very important concept within well, the evangelical world. In fact, it's, it's a, it's a very important concept in the minds of many Christians. And I went after it. I questioned it. In fact, I called it, I, I, in fact, I completely doubted it and, and, and spoke against it. And I can, I can feel the temperature change. All of a sudden, emails about this series came to an, like, all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> Look at the numbers of downloads, right? In fact, every episode in this series, the numbers have gone down. They have gone down. They have gone down. I have obviously ticked off a lot of people, and I did not mean to do so, but I'm sorry. I'm not going to approach the doctrine of of sanctification like every other Christian does, because I think that there is major problems with the way Christians approach this subject. But we will get to that right after I give you the correct introduction, right? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It is Thursday, August the 24th, 2023. It is currently 5.04 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central Studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. In the last episode of this series that we are doing on the doctrine of sanctification called Set Apart, I called into question the idea that is so popular amongst most Christians. And that idea is when you became a Christian, when you became a Christian, something happened, right? And now you have power you have ability you have you have insight that you did not possess prior to becoming a christian in fact i described it and some will say in a very you know a way that's very offensive but i described it as do you remember when you were a kid and you watched super friends or you watched batman or you saw the superman movie or whatever superman movies plural whatever the case may be you you would see you know, a cartoon or a movie, something to do with superheroes. And next thing you know, you were like, I need a cape. I need a cape. So you went and you found a towel in your house, right? You took the towel, you threw it over your shoulders. You found a clip, a clothespin, and you, and you clipped it around your neck and you ran around the house with that towel as a cape. And you are now a super hero. And then your mind, you were flying. In your mind, you were crashing through walls. In your mind, you were defeating the bad guy. Bullets were bouncing off of you because you now had superpower, right? Because it was pretend. And then you'd be jumping off the couch. Who knows what you were doing? And then you would hit something and then you would start crying. And then so much for your superpower because you would be hit with reality, right? You'd be running, trip and fall. And then your knee is bleeding or whatever the case may be. You would cry and you realize you're not really a superhero. In your mind, you are. You're convincing yourself you are for pretend. But as soon as reality hits you in the face, you next thing you know, you're crying. You're crying and you're taking off the towel and you're like, <laughs> and then I'm going to go do something else. And then you're, you're back to doing something else because you got hit in the face with reality. Well, the evangelical world likes to tell you when you became saved, dun, dun, da, da, now you have power. You can say yes to God and no to sin. You can do it. You can keep the law. 
But then somewhere they'll say, but, but I mean, you can't do it perfectly. Well, wait a minute. I thought you said I could. I mean, you can, but you really can't. I mean, you can to a level. I mean, okay, you have power. Okay, well, you don't have unlimited power. I mean, I mean, you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you, strengthening you to say no to sin. And yes, to, I mean, what? I mean, you're still going to sin. I mean, you're still going to fall. But but, but you can't. And it's this really convoluted thing that supposedly you ha- you've been set free from sin. But I mean, you still can't be sinless. I mean, you have power. I mean, but you can't be sinless. I mean, you, and, and it's this really speak out of both sides of your mouth, convoluted, contradictory concept that's in the evangelical world. And they will tell you now that you are a Christian. The Holy Spirit's leading you into all truth. He is showing you what the word means. He's helping you interpret it. However, the reality is, Christians that don't agree on anything. We don't agree on baptism, the Lord's Supper, salvation. So once again, the claim doesn't meet the reality. The claim of power, and you can say no to sin and yes to God, don't meet the reality that you sin every single day. I'll give you one scripture. Be holy as he is holy. You never will be. You can't be. It's impossible. That is law. The law is to show you you can't do it. That's why you have to rely on the imputed righteousness of Christ. You have to rely on the the holiness that God demands is accredited to your account by faith alone, apart from works. So I called into question the entire power being given concept. I called it all into question and I felt the temperature change. So I know I've probably already lost 90% 90% of the audience. So that tells me I probably shouldn't even finish this series. I should just give up and go do something else. But I'm not going to give up because this is going to be, remember this series when I started said it was not going to be done the normal way, right? It's not going to be done the normal way. And so we haven't approached it in the normal way. And I've tried to use different illustrations, right? I try to talk about mispronouncing a word, right? Well, when you put That mispronouncing of a word next to a standard of you are to never mispronounce a word. You are to always say it correctly. I always fall short. Well, if you put your life next to God's perfect law, you always fall short. You are never going to be able to accomplish it. That's why when we think of sanctification, well, do we, how much power do we have? Because nobody, no, everybody knows we can't be perfect. So how does sanctification actually work? And do we see sanctification more as a positional reality or a practical reality? Do we see it as, well, there, I mean, there's so many issues in regards to it. So we are going to proceed, even though I know I should probably, I don't know, I, I can't, I can't continue to talk about the power issue. Uh, Christians constantly tell people that if, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, all things have become new. Well, obviously that's true positionally. That is not true practically in the slightest because not the old is not gone. You still have the old nature. All things are not new. You still have an old nature. So any person be, being told that you're going to, you're going to find yourself being hit with a reality that says, no, you're not a new creature. The old is not gone. Not everything is new. True positionally, not true practically. And for some weird reason, Christianity has lost this important concept. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue. Remember the thing that's guiding this, the guiding this discussion so far. We haven't deviated too far. We're going to be bringing in audio. We're going to be reviewing audio. We're going to be doing a lot of interesting things as this series continues. There's no end date for this series. Anytime I want to talk about things related to the subject of sanctification, it, they're going to find, they're going to show up in this series. All right. So this, who knows when it will ever end, right? I don't know if they'll ever have an official end, but we are using the summer 2023 adult personal study guide. Bible Studies for Life, and they are spending six sessions on what we refer to as sanctification. And we we define sanctification as being set apart. We talked about being set apart in in eternity past, in election, in predestination. We talked being set apart positionally in Christ. We talked about being set apart positionally permanently in the future when we receive a glorified body and there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more sin, and no more death. And the main thing is how that the the real debate debatable issue is the sanctification that happens in the present in our practical life that is somehow a process and no one can quite completely figure it out. So 
we're using the study guide. In session one, they wanted us to look at Psalm 99 verses 1 through 9, which we did. It was an interesting place to start. And in some ways, I really appreciated where they started because they started in Psalm 99, 1 through 9. And what they wanted us to do is see the holiness of God. And as long as you'll be honest with the holiness of God, as long as you'll be honest with how perfect and holy God is and how per- and, and the perfection he demands, if you will be honest with that, then you will, uh, then you'll be able to truly see yourself and see how far you fall short. And every time you think you're progressing and some level of sanctification, you'll realize your life compared to God, you're always You're always a miserable sinner. You're never going to come close to that standard because it demands perfection internally and externally. It it demands perfection in your thoughts, in your words, in your desires, in your feelings, and in your deeds. So we need to be constantly reminded of the holiness of God. Then they took us to Romans chapter 6, where we came up with all kinds of, of difficulties there because this is the passage that everyone basically says, well, th- this pastor says you're dead, dead to sin. You're dead. You've been, you're, you're dead to sin. Well, if I'm dead to sin, then that means I should be able to stop sinning. So then we have to understand I, in Christ, I'm dead to sin. In my positional standing, I am practically, I'm very much alive to sin. Self is very much sitting on the throne practically over and over and over again. So we looked at Psalm 99, verses 1 through 9. We looked at Romans chapter 6, 5 through 14. We may not have covered everything in that section, but I think we did relatively okay. We took a little detour. We looked at kind of this little self-evaluation test. We talked about the problems with these kinds of tests. Then we did a little, another little detour where we talked about the, the whole power concept that is so ingrained in the minds of Christians. And today... Session three, according to the study guide, obviously we are, have gone, we've done more broadcasts than these sessions so far. They want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter two. Now, let me say this right from the start. The way I decided to do this session, because I don't know where it's going. I was afraid that if I looked at it in advance, that what I would do is say, you know what? This doesn't really fit. I don't know why they have this here, and I would have possibly just thrown it out and skipped it. So to keep myself from doing that, I have not even looked at this in advance. We're going to look at it together in real time and try to figure out why they have 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16, and a study on the doctrine of sanctification. How are they applying this to sanctification? What? Clearly, they're looking at sanctification more only from a practical standpoint. They've not really dealt with the positional aspect of it. They haven't even dealt with the fact that Christ is my sanctification, which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians. Um, but they want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Now, they refer to this session as set apart, but not alone. Okay, so I, I, I'm set apart, but I'm not alone. Now, is this idea of not being alone key to my sanctification? For me to be sanctified. Now, again, they're speaking of it in practical terms, not positional terms. For me to, to to progress in this process of sanctification, this progressive sanctification, where I'm being more and more set apart, is one of the key elements to this is to realize, hey, I am not alone. And if I realize I'm not alone then I will progress more quickly. Is, is, that, is that where they're going? Where do you think they're going? Well, we're going to open up the, uh, the study guide to this session. And we're just going to, I hope you're ready to just sit back and we're just going to walk through it. You ready? All right, here we go. Set apart, but not alone. Underneath it is a photograph. The photograph is of two men sitting on a couch. One is a younger man, maybe in his 20s, maybe or maybe maybe late 20s. The other one is an elderly man, maybe in his 70s. The younger man is looking at the older man, and the younger man is cracking up, and the older man has kind of a sly little grin. All right? So, hey, you're not alone. All right? Is, is that the image they want? So who's with me here? Then it says, question one, what makes the wisest person you know seem so wise? Okay, what has that got to do with sanctification? 
I'm turning the page. Page 84. Page 84. The point, at the very top of the page, the point, the Holy Spirit helps us know how to live holy lives. Oh, now I think I know where they're going. All right. Do you see where this, uh, do you see where you, or can you guess where you think it's going? I, I think I can guess. The concept seems to be here. Okay. In sanctification, yes, you're to be set apart, but you're never going to be alone. And clearly what they're going to say, I'm never going to, why I'm never going to be alone is I have the Holy Spirit. And because I have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is helping me in this supposed progressive process of sanctification helps me to know how to live holy lives. So this seems to imply, once again, the whole power idea that God is stepping in. Now he gives me the Holy Spirit. Now I have secret knowledge. I have special knowledge. Now, I would argue we learn how to, we learn about the, uh, we learn about God's call to live a holy life in the pages of scripture. Now, some will say we are taught how to live holy lives in the scriptures. But what typically the church does with that is, hey, this is how you live a holy life. You keep the law. But uh, let me make it very clear. If you give people law and tell them keep it, they will be holy. You don't even understand holiness because you, first of all, you'll never be able to keep the law. We are incapable of keeping the law. That's why we need an imputed righteousness. Secondly, even if you tell them to keep the law, the best someone could possibly do is maybe try to keep part of it externally. They're never going to keep it internally. So if you tell people the way to be holy is keep the law, you're, you're not helping them keep the law. They're never going to be able to do it. So all you're doing is leading them to a perpetual cycle of failure. But for some reason, the evangelical church can't figure that out. All right, so where do you think they're going to go? Well, underneath that, to the left of the page, they have a, a, it looks like, it's an image of some ancient ruins. I don't know if, I think it's in Greece. I think it's in Greece. Um, I, I would have to identify the location of these ruins. But ancient ruins, it's obviously some kind of ancient temple, it looks like. And it says, the Bible meets life. On a recent trip, on a recent trip to Europe, now this is not me speaking, this is the study guide, all right? We're going to see where they're going to go here. We already, I think I already have an idea of where they're taking us. On a recent trip to Europe, I visited Greece, known for producing the greatest minds in history. Interestingly, the word philosophy comes from a Greek term meaning lover of wisdom, all right? I don't know. Do you know where they're going yet? I don't know where they're going. For centuries, many considered Greece's oracle at Delphi to be the single greatest source of wisdom. The oracle's priestess, and please forgive me if I'm saying her name incorrectly, Pythia, P-Y-T-H-I-A, Pythia, was sought out by people from around the world in hopes of learning what the so-called God Apollo might say through her about purifying guilt, the future, and the will of his father Zeus. Later in Athens, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle spent their time discussing the latest and greatest ideas. A little later, the Roman Empire gifted the city of Athens with uh, Hadrian's library, one of the greatest collections of human knowledge in existence. The Greek tradition sought to understand the good life. They pursued the virtue of wisdom, but these were not rooted in the wisdom of God. The Apostle Paul exposed the deficiency during his visit, visit to Athens and to other Grecian cities during his missionary journeys. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now, like then, people desperately search for advice. How to live. In this session, we will learn how the Holy Spirit helps us know how to live in ways that pleases God. So, what it seems is in ancient times, 
People went to different places to gain wisdom, to gather insight, to gather knowledge. They went to teachers. They went to this priestess. They went to gain this information. But now, as a Christian, you now have the Holy Spirit inside of you. This is their their claim. That's going to help you know So the source of knowledge, you have a supernatural source of knowledge as a Christian, and it's the Holy Spirit. They didn't say that you would go to the scriptures. They say you have the Holy Spirit. Now, what they're going to say is the Holy Spirit helps you understand the scriptures. But if the Holy Spirit's helping us understand the scriptures after 2000 years of church history, we should all agree. So clearly there's already, once again, the pretend game where we're running around pretending to be a superhero versus the reality that's going to smack us in the face. But they're claiming the Holy Spirit gives us knowledge. And this knowledge is to teach you how to live in ways that pleases God. So you have the Holy Spirit. And what's going to lead to your sanctification practically is you're going to get knowledge. Just like that. And boom, 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 boom. Now you know what to do. Now you know how to do it. Now, the typical evangelical would say God not only gives you the knowledge of what to do, he gives you the power to do it. Well, if I just take those two principles, I can put them to a simple test. I don't even need the Holy Spirit to tell me anything. The Bible says, be ye holy as God is holy. That tells me what to do. According to them, God gives me the power to do it. So according to them, I should be able to be as holy as God is holy. Guess what? I can't do it, never can do it, never will do it. So their entire theory that God not only tells me what to do, he gives me the power to do it, falls completely apart and it blows up and it's completely frivolous and wrong. So then that leaves us, well, then how are we sanctified? But we, we've got to continue, right? We've got to continue to see where they're going to go with this. Where are they going to go with this? Well, let's see. They want us to read 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. This is the passage they want us to read. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And they uh, want us to read verse 9, but, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that Love him. What do you think that has to do with sanctification? Well, let, let's see what they do with it. Are, are you interested to see what they do with it? I'm interested to see what they do with it. Here we go. Though we live in a world that appears infinitely more advanced in the first century, the issues raised by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians are largely the same. He was witnessing the deficiency of the wisdom of of the age and of its rulers and who were coming to nothing. So he's saying what Paul realizes, hey, the wisdom they have, it is useless. It is futile. It is uh, it's leading people nowhere. So what they need is a better kind of wisdom. All right. Hang on. Let's see what he says here. All right. The utter hopelessness of it all even as we drown in knowledge and worldly wisdom that was unimaginably only decades ago has produced a pandemic of emotional pain and personal meaningless. So meaninglessness. So he says, hey, in the time of the church at Corinth, the world that with the wisdom that they were finding and hearing, it was leading them to nothing. And in our day and age, we are drowning we are, uh, it says we drown in knowledge and in worldly wisdom, but it has only produced a pandemic of emotional pain and personal meaninglessness. All right. So, so what, what he's saying is we don't just need knowledge and we don't need worldly wisdom. We need something else. If we're, I guess we're going to then progress in this process of sanctification, I guess is the argument. Now, here comes the next paragraph. You ready? Here we go. In contrast, God's children 
have access to the fountain of wisdom, the Holy Spirit. Let's stop right here. Now, once again, this is the typical evangelical mindset. See those people over there? They have no power. They have no insight. They have nothing but me. I'm a Christian. I have power. I can say no to sin. Yes to God. I have understanding. And oh, by the way, I have access to the fountain of wisdom. Meaning, basically the way the church teaches is that as Christians, we basically should be sinless and the most wise people on the entire planet. But I have known Christians throughout my life, and I hate to say it, I don't perceive great wisdom or insight. In fact, I sometimes don't even want to hear what Christians have to say, because in many cases, it is crazy, it is foolish, it is, it is, blo- I mean, Christians fall for conspiracy theories and misinformation all the time. I don't see Christians as being wise, I see Christians as being easily manipulated and deceived. But supposedly we have access to the fountain of all wisdom. He teaches us. Now, once again, here we go. Here we go. Now, this is the common evangelical teaching, right? Hey, in your sanctification, why? what's going to help you in your process of sanctification? You are literally being taught by God himself. Look what he says. He teaches us through our inner being by shining a divine spotlight on the word of God and illuminating its truth. Now, I was taught this my whole Christian life. This is standard Christian evangelical teaching, right? Okay, we have revelation. We have inspiration. And we have illumination. Oh man, that makes a three-point outline. You can preach that all day. And everybody will say amen. And everyone will write it down. And then everyone walks away going, that's right. The Holy Spirit illuminates me. See, when I'm studying my Bible, I will say, God, open my eyes. Let me see. And then God always answers that prayer. And then whenever I interpret the scripture, I'm interpreting the scripture through the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, my interpretation, by definition, should be, ladies and gentlemen, say it with me. It should be perfect. It should be almost inspired. In fact, it should be infallible. I mean, if the Holy Spirit's the one illuminating you. So I guess what? I could be talking to some Presbyterian and they could be like, no, the Bible teaches that you take a baby eight days old, you put water on its forehead in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you now put the mark of the covenant. And now that child becomes a member of the visible church. It's right there in the Bible. I don't think it, none of that is in the Bible, but okay, I digress. And I can say, no, 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 no. And my study of scripture and the Holy Spirit illuminated me. The Bible teaches that someone must believe before they are baptized, that they are to be taught and believe, then are baptized, then they enter the church. Now, I guess what? The Presbyterian would claim, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit illuminated me. And I'll be like, no, no, no. The Holy Spirit illuminated me. And then someone else will come in. A Pentecostal will say, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit illuminated me. And you should be baptized, should be immersion. It isn't for babies, but, 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 but it should only be in the name of Jesus. And then the Church of Christ saying, no, 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 yeah, it's not for babies. You must believe. Oh, but it's required for salvation. And then a Lutheran come along. No, 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 no. Not only is it for babies, it's regenerative. It washes away sin. And then on and on and on and on. And everyone claiming that the Holy Spirit's teaching them, that the Holy Spirit's leading them into all truth. Everyone claims that. Well, then something's wrong, ladies and gentlemen. The illuminating power of the supposed Holy Spirit enlightening our minds and teaching us probably seems to have the power of a burnt out flashlight. Oh, I can feel the temperature getting even colder now. Nobody wants to hear this, but someone's got to stop and go, something's wrong with our thing. This is a common thing. So how, so what leads to your sanctification? You've got the, you, look, You don't need your pastor. You don't need the church. You don't need seminary. You got the Holy Spirit teaching you. You got the Holy Spirit illuminating the scriptures for you. 
All you got to do is sit down with a Bible and a notebook and you've got a divine flashlight inside of you illuminating the meaning of the scriptures. You don't need a Bible dictionary. You don't need a Bible encyclopedia. You've got God himself leading you into all truth. So don't worry about listening to anyone. You, I mean, you, you're basically a walking seminary yourself. I mean, you've got God inside of you. That's what this leads to. And say, well, people say, well, no, it doesn't work quite like that. Well, you can try to modify it. You can try to you can try to limit it. And, and the more you back it up, sooner or later, it becomes a meaningless concept. Either the Holy Spirit's literally in you, teaching you and leading you into all truth, meaning then anything you believe is truth because, well, the Holy Spirit led you to it. So then nobody can tell you that you're wrong. You're infallible. But why is it that the Holy Spirit led you to a truth that he didn't lead me to and our truths contradict one another? Some of one of us is not being led by the Holy Spirit or neither one of us is being led by the Holy Spirit. And nobody ever stops to go, this whole concept seems completely and utterly and literally broken. And it is. Those promises were for those who wrote the Bible, for the apostles that led the church before a completed written revelation was given. For the prophets, once God's completed revelation right here was given, all of that stopped. And now we understand through reading and interpreting a, something that's in a written form. We got to define words. We have to know context, syntax, historical context. We have to read. We have to struggle. We have to question. And the, and the one who understands is not because of some supernatural work inside of them. It's the one who spends the most time with sweat and blood working to understand it. Not physical blood, but metaphorically, sweat and blood effort. Let me read this to you again. See, in contrast to those poor people out there who don't understand anything, we as Christians, we have access to the fountain of wisdom. We have the Holy Spirit. He teaches us through inner, if, through our inner being by shining a divine spotlight on the word of God and illuminating its truth. Divine knowledge is far more than the facts, trivia, and technical knowledge found on the internet. God's his hidden wisdom far overshadows all of that that is available to us in the hollowed halls of today's universities, global think tanks, and other religious communities. So now I want you to hear this. See, you could, what you have overshadows everything you can get in a university and a global think tank, or any other religious community. What you get, because God is inside of you teaching you, is far more than you can get in seminary, Bible college, Bible institute, church conference, small group, Sunday school, or church. I don't even know then why we have any of those institutions. Because if the average Christian, without any formal education, now has more wisdom and can understand God's word more than all this knowledge that comes from these other institutions of higher learning, then what's the point of having, why do pastors spend all of this money to go get a education? What's the point? What's the point of having seminaries? What's the point of even having church? You literally can sit at your kitchen table on a Sunday morning with a cup of coffee and you've got literally God inside of you teaching you. You don't need your pastor. He doesn't know any more than you do. In fact, you should be coming to the same conclusion since you both have the same Holy Spirit supposedly enlighten you and teaching you. Christians never stop to, to just think about the ramifications of what these, what is said within the evangelical world. This makes literally no sense. They continue, like the apostles before us, believers with minds anointed by divine discernment and the authority of scripture possess a cohesive worldview and insight into truth. Oh yeah, Christians have such a cohesive worldview. Give me a break. Christians constantly contradict themselves, say some of the craziest and outmost outrageous things that sometimes there's just, it's just absolutely fraudulent and not true. I've heard Christians promote absolute and utter conspiracy theories. And when I said you're believing, they will tell me, 
I'm blinded by Satan. I remember telling people, no, kids were actually killed in the Sandy Hook Elementary School and receiving emails from listeners saying, you're blinded by Satan. There were crisis actors. No kids were sa- No kids were killed there. They just said that to take our guns. I remember being told that Obama was going to have us all microchipped and we're going to be put in FEMA camps and we were going to be killed if we didn't take the microchip. And then I was told we were all going to become Muslims. And then I've been told by Christians over and over and over. Wrong, wrong, lies, lies, wrong, wrong, lies, lies, wrong, wrong, lies, lies. Then it's a bunch of garbage to turn around and say, hey, 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 like the apostles. Believers with minds anointed by the divine discernment and the authority of scripture possess a cohesive worldview and insight into truth. Now, what I have seen is that Christians are just as messed up and flawed in our thinking as the people in the world. These help us, see, because We have the Holy Spirit teaching us. These help us to know how to live holy lives that are set apart, even when we find ourselves alone, confused, deserted, or estranged. So even if we're completely alone, even if we're completely estranged, even if we don't even have a church, dun, dun, da, da, the Holy Spirit's inside of you. He's teaching you. He's enlightening you. You can do it. You don't need anything. It goes on to say, When communicating to others using the authority of Scripture, God can use us to speak truth into people's lives. This uncommon wisdom is a mystery to many around us, including many societal, educational, political, and religious leaders. See, hey, hey, see, we got, because if you'll listen to God, you can even confound the religious leaders. (laughs) Those religious leaders, those pastors, those seminary professors, They're all idiots because you know. And you see that mindset in the minds of many Christians. (laughs) This, this is crazy. Now, as in Paul's time, believers speaking truth given by the Spirit and the Word of God are mocked and made the target of others' derision and ridicule. The same spirit of Antichrist is the one which led to the crucifixion of our Lord, and that is a source of persecution of Christians today. God's children must reject the thought that any of our spiritual insights represent our own intellectual brilliance. We should also disavow other people's praise of what they consider our own shrewd thinking or penetrating discernment. Any genuine visible insight, any genuine valuable insight we have is nothing more than a reflection from the person of God. Even so, the student of scripture who submits to the Holy Spirit often encounters truths that are too wonderful for us today, too lofty for us to attain. Their whole concept is, hey, and and they took that from 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 9, which simply says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of the world, not of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for he had known it, they would not have crucified the, uh, the Lord of glory. But it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, First of all, when Paul speaking of himself or the religious leaders, they were given revealed revelation by God because God spoke to them in different ways at that time. The time is coming, though, that when for God, he speaks to us through his word. So you got to be very careful even right there to compare ourselves to the apostles, which in this article they did as if we are getting the same kind of revelation the apostles got. That is utter ridiculousness. And that's straight up charismatic theology. And this is not a charismatic supposed company who produced this. It's supposed to be a company in line with the SBC. But the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention, has been greatly infiltrated by charismatic theology. Now, they want us to read verses 10 through 13. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no, no man, but the spirit of God. Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And then verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth concerning comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, once again, for the apostles, for those people at this time, divine revelation, God speaking, that God was doing all kinds, of, revealing, doing things in a way far different uh, until the, the end of the apostolic age. Then things, that ceases and then now what we what we live in an age where we understand through the written word of God. We have one source of authority, one source of revelation, the end. But they're going to continue to compare this to us. Here we go. Here we go. You ready? Listen to how they how they're going to cover it. Here we go. Our brains are endowed by God with tremendous capacities. Though God's, through God's, no, it says though God's, I'm sorry, though God's inspired, infallible, inerrant word came from the heart and mind of God, it was filtered through the brain of a prophet, apostle, and other divinely anointed scribes, which wrote it down. Okay, I got no problem with that. That is God giving revelation and through the, through inspiration, giving us scripture in a written form. That where God's revelation is now here. But now he's not giving revelation any anywhere else. Now it's in scripture. It's hard to imagine that God, the ancient of days, didn't give his divine truth directly to the world with uh, without, let's see, let, let me go back and read this. This is on two separate parts and it's kind of disconnected. All right, let's go to this. It's hard to imagine that God, the ancient of days, didn't give his divine truth directly to the world without the involvement of humans in the process. Instead, he chose to use select, deeply faithful, but also flawed people to assist in the transmission of sacred scripture. As it was, the Holy Spirit aided the process to prevent human error in the texts that were written. Divine wisdom passed through human authors, spirit-enabled minds, and ultimately into sacred writ, handwritten scripture. Okay, I got no problem with that. Got no problem with that. That means this is unique. I'm holding up my Bible. This is special. This is unique. This is the authority. You want to be sanctified, then whatever, however the process of sanctification unfolds in our practical standing, obviously our positional standing, it's instantaneous. We are sanctified in Christ. But in our practical positional, in our practical standing, our everyday life, sanctification, if it's going to occur, it's not through some special secret divine supernatural knowledge inside of me, God doing, no, no, it's through the, it's the scriptures. It's through the scriptures. It's the reading and memorizing of scripture. It's through scripture washes us. Scripture convicts us. Scripture teaches us. All right, now here we go. 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 Something commonly misunderstood by people unfamiliar with how God fashioned humanity is the fact that the brain and the mind are not the same thing. Now, what I would like you to do, I would like you to get some Bible dictionaries, and we won't do this right now. I mean, if I was at church, I would have everyone do it right now, and see if you have an entry for brain or you have an entry for mind. Is the mind and the brain the same thing or are they different? Is the brain and the mind the same thing within Christian theology, the Christian understanding of the makeup of man? The brain and the mind, are they separate? Is the mind and the heart separate? Or is the mind and the heart the same thing and the brain is different? Is the brain the seat of our intellect and the the mind or the heart is the seat of our emotions, our feelings, our motivations? I I would challenge you to see if there's universal agreement on this. They say 
the brain and the mind are not the same thing. Only persons have minds and identities. This includes gods, angels, and humans. So while the brain being a part of the body, the mind is part of what the mind is part of what we think of as the spiritual nature of humanity. Now they're saying the, the mind is a part of the spiritual nature. Not only does that truth bear out in scripture, but evidence of this has been discovered in modern brain research. In short, humans are not merely made of matter. We also have an essence that is immaterial, non-corporeal, and spiritual. Okay. So they say that this, this concept that the brain and the mind are two separate things is found not only in scripture. They don't offer any scripture to show us this, but they say it's found in modern brain research. They say, in short, humans are not merely made of matter. We also have an essence that the, it, that is immaterial, non-corporeal and spiritual. As believers consider the wonder of how God created us, we must understand that without the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we would be under utterly incapable of understanding the things of God. A mind unsubmitted to the authority of the Spirit will unwittingly find its way to misunderstand God's actions and our lives. Now, this is very dangerous, right? Because you say, okay, you can't understand the things of God unless you have what they say. You have to... Um, you have to make sure you have submitted to the authority of the spirit. See, if you've not submitted to the spirit, uh, to, if you have not submitted to the authority of the spirit, you can't understand the things of God. Now, look at how this can be used. Well, you know why, you know why Presbyterians don't agree with me on baptism? They haven't submitted to the spirit of God. You know why Lutherans don't agree with me on baptism? They have not submitted to the authority of the Spirit of God. You know why Charismatics don't agree with me? They have not submitted to the authority of the Spirit of God. Now, guess what they could turn around and say? The reason I don't agree with them on baptism or their theology is because I have not submitted to the authority of the Spirit of God. Isn't it funny that every person thinks that they have submitted to the authority of the Spirit of God, and that's why they understand No, understanding scripture is based off the study of how to interpret written words. Here's, the, here's uh, one of the last paragraphs. Here we go. And it's just weird. This is the passage. They've not really, they've not really told us exactly how any of this is taught in this scripture. They've not really done anything here. And, and, and I, I can clearly demonstrate that this is primarily focused on the, uh, on Paul and the apostles and the, and the spiritual leaders of the church of Corinth. But okay. He says the Holy Spirit that they go on to say, I don't know who the author is of this particular study. Yeah, maybe at the end it will tell me, but they go on to say, the Holy Spirit greatly affects and enables our ability to meditate on truth, interpret scripture, and discern error. Now, here we go. Once again, so supposedly as a Christian, because you have the Holy Spirit, now you, you now have a supernatural ability to meditate on truth. You now supposedly have a, a supernatural ability to interpret scripture and you supposedly now have a supernatural ability to discern error. You know what I would want? I would wish Christians just have the supernatural ability to remember what I preached last Sunday. But get, once again, do you see the controversy how this... So if the Holy Spirit gives me some kind of ability to interpret scripture, then, then you can't question my interpretation because it comes from the Holy Spirit. Therefore, my interpretation is infallible. And if I say that you're in error, it's because the Holy Spirit gave me the discernment to determine that you're in error. So therefore, anything body I say is in error is an infallible doc dogmatic declaration you can't question. This ability is free, freely available to every fully surrendered believer. So to every fully surrendered believer, you do not need seminary because God, the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to meditate on truth, to interpret the scripture and discern error. You don't even need to learn Bible study methods. That's just, it's totally ludicrous. This whole teaching, which is, which is ingrained in the minds of Christians everywhere is ridiculous. 
Now listen to this. This ability is freely available to every fully surrendered believer and not just to rare classes of disciples with seminary degrees or decades in the faith. You don't even need to be a Christian that long. You definitely don't need seminary. You just need to be saved, have the Holy Spirit, fully surrender to the Holy Spirit, and dun, dun, da da run to the closet, grab that towel, get a clothespin, put the cape on, and run around your house saying, I understand the Bible better than everyone else. I understand you're an error, and I know the truth. Now, you, your family may think you're crazy, but you can say that you're doing this because the Theology Central podcast told you so. And hey, 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 I, I have sp- spiritual insight, so, you know. We are able to understand the things of God and live them out because the Holy Spirit empowers us. Now, listen, if you can understand the things of God and live them out because of the power of the Holy Spirit, ladies and gentlemen, you should be sinless. Listen, there should be no doctrinal error in your life and you should be sinless. As this happens, God imparts wisdom through his spirit. With the Spirit's help, he often grants us the ability and opportunity to communicate what he's taught us to others. Why do you need to teach it to others? If they have the same Holy Spirit, they don't need you. As he does, we become a source of blessing to others through helping them understand the deep truths of God. Why does anyone need help? All they got to do is fully surrender to the Holy Spirit. And ladies and gentlemen, they can understand God's word. They don't even need a seminary education. And dun, 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 they have supernatural power to obey the law. Therefore, Christianity should be Christians who are doctrinally no, no problems. Everyone's on the same page and everyone lives a sinless life. Oh, 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 oh. I could read more. They're just going to double down and double down and double down and double down on this point. Now, I do believe that if you, as a Christian, if you open up the Bible and you read it and you study it, you are gaining insight to the mind of God. You are gaining spiritual wisdom. Not because the Holy Spirit's teaching you in some supernatural way, because you're reading the words and understanding the words. And that this wisdom is contrary to the wisdom of the world. In fact, this wisdom is contrary to your wisdom. The thoughts you're going to read are contrary to your thoughts. And I do believe it gives us great insight if we are reading and interpreting them correctly. I do agree with that. But I reject this whole concept that once again, that we are endowed with some supernatural ability. This is the the whole evangelical concept of sanctification is predicated on this idea of power and ability. I want to read more, but I'm just going to stop. I'm going to kind of let, I'm just going to let that kind of hang there. Now, I know the temperature has already changed. I know people are not happy with this. And I know most of you strongly disagree with all of these concepts. But look, you've got two ways of living. Go put the towel on, get the clothespin, run around the house pretending to be a superhero. I don't know when and I don't know where, but sooner or later, boom, boom. You're going to hit reality and you're going to realize all the ability and power you claim you don't really have. And if all Christians had it, we should be sinless. We should all be believing the same thing. 2000 years of church history shows that is not even anywhere remotely close to the reality we know exists, but Christians try to pretend it doesn't. Email me, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. Anyone who happens to have the Bible study for life, the summer 2023 issue, you can go read the rest of it and you'll see how they double down, triple down. They just keep doubling down on their concepts. And uh, well, once again, I reject it outright. 
All right. Thanks for listening. Again, email me newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. And uh, well, we'll talk again soon. God bless.